Now, it's really hard for me to believe, but some people think doctrine is boring. Other people think doctrine, what you believe as a Christian, is irrelevant. Now, often the reason for the misperception is it's been presented in such a way that it is boring and it is irrelevant. So you hear a doctrine presented and you listen and you wrestle with it and you try to understand it, but at the end of the day, you're still left with questions like, so what? Why do I care? What does any of this have to do with the price of eggs? Why can't we just love Jesus and leave theology behind? But on the flip side, there are intellectuals who are consumed with doctrine, such an extent that their heads are so deep in the books, they forget that we live in the 21st century. So their intellectualism is lost in the clouds and the rubber never hits the road with regard to the reality of life. But I want to encourage you. First John doesn't fit either of those categories. John's not a pragmatist where doctrine doesn't matter. John's not an intellectual where life doesn't matter. Instead, he's balanced. And doctrine really does matter. In fact, Christianity stands or falls on the person of Christ and the work of Christ. It succeeds or fails on whether or not his incarnation actually took place. But there's debate, isn't there, over who Jesus is and what Jesus did. For example, some believe Jesus was a liar, so wasn't really who he said he was and knowingly deceived people. Others believe Jesus was a lunatic, somebody not quite right in the head, thought he was somebody that he really wasn't. Others believe Jesus was a legend, so someone others just imagined and wanted him to be. Yet some believe Jesus is Lord, the one true God-man, whose death, burial, and resurrection confirm it. But in our current culture and context, that's debated with all sorts of confusion, distortions, inaccuracies, and denials regarding the Jesus revealed in the Bible. But that's not new, is it? Nothing new under the sun. The Apostle John faced all the same challenges that we're facing right now. So essentially, 1 John was written, if you will, to answer the Jesus question. And to set the record straight once and for all as to who this is this Jesus and why did he do that? Why did he do the things that he did? Why did John write this letter? Because he knew if you get the Jesus question right, then everything else falls into place, including the assurance of salvation and the certainty of joy. And I'm thinking this morning, we need the exact same thing, especially in this day and age filled with confusion, distortions, and inaccuracies. We need to make sure our own understanding of the Jesus question is correct. So we too might have the assurance of salvation and might have the certainty of joy. So if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles with me to 1 John. 1 John is way at the back of your Bible, so you can move from Revelation back, Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. It's on page 1021. If you're using one of the Bibles in the chairs in front of you, I encourage you to have my outline in your Bible I do want to let you know this morning that we're going to be bouncing all over the place in 1 John, but praise God, that's like a flip of one page. So only five chapters, but just fair warning, we're going to be moving around a bit. I'm not staying in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. I'm going to argue that this is all throughout the letter. So hey, the author of the letter. Well, as you're turning, let me jump into number one. Wrong Christology, by giving you a little background, including the author and the reason for why he wrote this letter. So A, the author of the letter. I want you to know the vast majority of evangelical scholars agree that the Apostle John is the author of 1 John, so the early church fathers, modern theologians, pastors, preachers, professors all agree Apostle John wrote 1 John. And one of the reasons 
is the consistency in language, especially between the Gospel of John and 1 John. So repeated words, themes, and ideas, including life and death, light and darkness, the word in the world, love for God, love for one another, and a desperate need to keep God's commands, which aren't burdensome. When we rightly believe Jesus was in the beginning with God and Jesus is God. So John, the son of Zebedee, brother of James, is the undisputed author. But he's also the author of four other books in the New Testament, including the Gospel of John, written by the way to convert the sinner. Then the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, written to confirm the saints. And then lastly, the book of Revelation, written to coronate the Savior. There's even a pattern to his writing, which includes a very clear purpose statement right at the end of the book to give B the reason for the letters. So in the Gospel of John, he says, John chapter 20, verse 31, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So again, the Gospel of John written to convert the sinner. So then why was 1 John written? Or B, what's the reason for this letter? Well, look with me at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Because he gives us the purpose again right before the end of the book. When he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know certainty that you have eternal life. So what's the purpose of 1 John? It's number one, to provide assurance of salvation. John has other goals, because one of the ways to provide assurance of salvation is number two, by protecting believers against false teachers. If you would flip to 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, notice what John says. He says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Now, what things has he written? Well, back up to verse 21. 1 John 2, verse 21. He just said, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. Now, just think about that, because John just said there's absolutely a wrong understanding out there about who Jesus is. I mean, verse 22, who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. So that's the false teacher who has, number one, a wrong Christology. So a wrong understanding of the person of Christ and a wrong understanding of the work of Christ which must be corrected. It must be clarified. Why is that so important? Because we're talking about heaven and hell, aren't we? That's why John says in verse 25, and this is the promise that he made to you, eternal life. This has everything to do with your eternal well-being. Jesus must be rightly understood for your eternal well-being to be secure. So again, how could you possibly think doctrine is boring or is somehow irrelevant? This is the most important reality in the world, that Jesus really is the incarnate Christ. And not just that he is the incarnate Christ, but that you believe in him as the incarnate Christ. Now before I move on from wrong Christology, to write Christology, let me clarify what John was writing against, namely the false teaching of Gnosticism, 
which comes from the Greek word meaning knowledge. So, so Gnostics taught the way of salvation that it came through a secret, special knowledge granted only to the elect. And what's unique about Gnosticism is they considered all matter, so, so that which is physical, to be evil. And only that which is spiritual to be good. For example, the physical body is wicked. It's sinful. But the soul, the spirit of a person, that is sacred. So physical things are evil, wicked, and sinful, but spiritual things are holy, righteous, and good. That's what they were teaching, which, as you can imagine, led to all sorts of doctrinal issues regarding Jesus, including the fact that they believe God couldn't possibly take on flesh. Why? Because the body, the, the physical part of Jesus, would then be evil. They'd argue a holy God can't possibly be contaminated with sin which is a major problem if you believe in the incarnation of Christ and the fact that God took on flesh and dwelt among us as the one true God, man, 100% God and 100% physical human being. So they created a whole new doctrine called docetism, which means to seem or to appear. So they taught that Jesus never had a literal human body, but only appeared to have a literal human body, which means they denied the humanity of Christ. They said Jesus was from God, but denied Jesus was God in the flesh. So his spirit was from God, no, no problem with that. But when Jesus was on the earth walking, talking, teaching, and eating, that wasn't actually Jesus in the flesh, but only the appearance of Jesus. So what people saw was more like a ghost or a phantom or a hologram. If you walked over to him, you couldn't have actually really touched him. Couldn't have shook his hand, couldn't have given him a hug because he had no physical body. So Gnosticism, Docetism, completely rejected the incarnation of Christ. So that's number one, wrong Christology. Now with that as the backdrop, look at how John speaks into that reality coming right out of the gate. I mean, this is how he starts his letter. He doesn't say, hey, how's it going? Greetings, I'm the Apostle John. I hope you're doing well to the churches in this sphere of influence. He doesn't come out with any greeting. Instead, look at what he says. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and is with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So number two, write Christology. What are the two main things that John is arguing for in the first four verses? Well, he's arguing, A, that Jesus is God, and B, that Jesus is man. So he's arguing against the false teaching of Gnosticism, which wholeheartedly rejected the incarnation of Christ. Let's start with A, Jesus is God. Notice how John starts, verse 1, by saying, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, seen, looked upon, and touched concerning the word of life. So the word of life that was from the beginning, who is clearly, verse 3, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Verse 2 says he was made manifest, meaning we've seen him, we've beheld him. His glory is of the only Son from the Father. So there has never been a time when the Son was not, never. He was before the beginning, in the beginning, and according to verse 1, he was from the beginning. That's what John believed. And if it's not crystal clear from 1 John chapter 1, then listen to the gospel of John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John clearly taught both here and in his gospel that Jesus is God, the divinity. Jesus is God, but he's not just God. B, Jesus is man, which is clearly the burden, isn't it? of these first three verses because he presents this rigorous, often repeated, constant beating of the drum defense for the genuine humanity of Jesus. In fact, John speaks as an eyewitness of all that Jesus did and all that Jesus said. This isn't hearsay. This isn't a secondhand account. John was there with Jesus for the entirety of his ministry and is testifying like a man on a stand before a packed courtroom with his right hand raised. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Notice the four things he declares, almost systematically, moving from one sense to the next. First, verse one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard with our own ears. Verse three, that which we heard we proclaim also to you. So he starts with hearing. Second, verse one, that which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon. Verse two, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it. And again, verse three, that which we have seen, we proclaim also to you. So there's this intentional, continual, purposeful, all over the course of three years, staring at the humanity of Jesus, watching him and his every move. Third, verse one, John says, we touched him. We touched him with our own hands. So there's no way he wasn't a real flesh and blood human. No way he's a ghost or a phantom or a hologram. Which is why fourth, verse two, John says, we testify that he was the word made flesh, God in human form, God is a real man that dwelt among us. And we joyfully proclaim to all of you who are reading this letter, then in him you may have eternal life. Look at verse three. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that, here's the purpose, you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and is with his Son, Jesus Christ. So I'm writing that you might have eternal life. So John declares for anyone and everyone to consider an audible, visible, tangible, and verbal witness concerning the physical humanity of Jesus. He is the Son of God. Now what I want to do is walk through 1 John so you can see how this theme that Jesus is the incarnate Christ is all over the place in this letter. Why is that? Because John's refuting false teachers and their insidious Gnosticism that is creeping into the church and causing people to believe all sorts of wrong things about who Jesus is which again has everything to do with eternal life, your eternal well-being. He's writing so they may know that they have eternal life. And one of the ways you know that you have eternal life is by having a right thinking about who Jesus is, the incarnate Christ, 
So let's start. Turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Look at what John says. 1 John 4, 1. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses, notice that Jesus has come in the flesh, is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. So the humanity of Christ is critical. And that humanity includes the reality that, number one, Jesus is sinless. Number two, Jesus atones for sin. And number three, Jesus guarantees eternal life. We'll start with number one. Jesus is sinless. Flip to 1 John 3, verse 4. John says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he, Jesus, appeared, so became one of us, took on humanity. Why? In order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So Jesus took on humanity, and yet Jesus was without sin. Why is that so important? Because it enables him to be a sacrificial substitute for our sin. So he had to be a human being in order to take the place of other human beings as our representative. But he also had to be sinless to bear our sins, take our place, and pay our penalty. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus being sinless has everything to do with him being our Savior. Number two, atoning for our sin. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. John says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, which of course we all Sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. So the satisfactory payment to God for our sin, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Universal offer of the gospel. Now look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. John says, little children, let no one deceive you. Again, writing against false teachers. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared, became one of us, took on flesh, dwelt among us, was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus atones for sin. By destroying the works of the devil and empowering us by his spirit to not walk in sin like the devil sinning constantly, but walking in righteousness like the Lord. What does that look like? Most clearly, it looks like love. Flip to 1 John 4, verse 9. John says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. God made manifest among us. Among us, hear that in light of the incarnation of Christ, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Because God's done that, taken on humanity, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, bore our sins, and paid our penalty on the cross through faith in Christ, the one true God-man, we can be guaranteed the hope of eternal life. Number three, Jesus guarantees life. Again, look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Who is the liar? Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Instead, verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in in you, then you too will abide in the Son, and you will abide in the Father. Verse 25, and this is the promise that he made to you. 
What is the promise? Eternal life. That's the upshot of the whole thing, that we might have the hope of eternal life. I mean, isn't that what you want to be sure of? Don't you want to be certain as you live this life that you're going to make it all the way home to glory? I know that's my goal. Life's pretty simple. I just want to go to heaven. And I want to take as many of you with me as possible. Well, John is saying that's only possible, eternal life, if you have a right understanding of the person of Christ and the work of Christ. You can't have eternal life if you don't have a right understanding of the person of Christ or the work of Christ. Flip forward, 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. I know, right? One page, back and forth. John says, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life, eternal life, is only in the Son. Whoever has the Son, rightly understood, has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God, rightly understood, does not have life. Do you see how clear that is? If you don't have a right understanding of who Jesus is, both in his humanity and his divinity, you're not going to heaven when you die. Doctrine is critical. Let me just pause to speak to anyone here who might be confused about Jesus. Because there's lots of theories out there about Jesus. And they all sound pretty good. But they will leave you dead in your trespasses and sins. For example, some think Jesus was just a good moral teacher. So they read the Sermon on the Mount. They, they read the four Gospels where Jesus says things like, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, don't worry about tomorrow, tomorrow has enough worries of its own, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. People hear those things, and they quickly agree. Jesus is a great moral teacher. But then they turn around, and they reject the fact that Jesus said he was God. John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. John 14, 9, the one who sees me sees the Father. John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. You see, Jesus can't be a great moral teacher and a liar at the same time. He's one or the other. Others think I can believe in Jesus, intellectually assent to his humanity and his divinity, and still do whatever I want in my life. So live a totally licentious life, addicted to my wants, enslaved to my pleasures. But that too will leave you dead in your trespasses and sins with no hope of heaven. Because Jesus said, John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me, believes in me, obeys me, trusts me, follows me, and keeps my commands will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and make myself known to him. You can't believe Jesus, say you love Jesus, and not obey Jesus. That's not possible according to the Bible. If you don't obey Jesus, then you don't really love Jesus. You don't really believe in Jesus. And you won't go to heaven when you die. Still others think Jesus was just a great example. So if I just follow Jesus' example... If I just do what Jesus did, then surely my good works will outweigh my bad works. 
What would Jesus do if I have the bracelet and I do it to the best of my ability? Surely my good works will outweigh my bad works. Surely I'll go to heaven when I die. That's not how it works. Your good works could never possibly outweigh your bad works because your sin is against an infinitely holy God. Even one sin against an infinitely holy God is worthy to send you to hell for all eternity. Please, listen to me. There's only one way to go to heaven when you die. And that's by putting your faith in the one true God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, died to save you from your sins, and promises eternal life with him in heaven when you die. But you have to have a right understanding of who he is. You cannot make him up. You have to accept who he says he is. Because that's the only way that he can atone for your sins. And guarantee you the hope of heaven. I appeal to you, put your faith in Christ, the God-man. It's only in him that you can have the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. But I want you to know, when you do, your life is going to radically change. Because believing in Jesus looks like something. In fact, it transforms, literally every single area of your life. Which is why the way you live your life tells you what you actually believe about Jesus. So faith in Christ, the incarnate Christ, the God-man, is really just the first domino in a whole series of dominoes that gives us a glorious assurance of salvation. So number one, wrong Christology. Number two, right Christology. Now number three, what it looks like to have a working Christology. Look again at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, or at least say that you believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know for certain, for sure, that you have eternal life. So here's the question. As we walk through 1 John over the course of the next five weeks, what things should we be looking for in our own individual lives that when we see them should give us a growing assurance that we really do have eternal life? How many things are there and what are they? So we might know for certain without the shadow of a doubt that we have eternal life. Well, I've listed them right there in your outline. As I read through 1 John, I think there's six ways in which you can know for certain that you have eternal life. So number one, believe Jesus is the Christ. Christianity stands or falls on the person and work of Christ because Jesus is the one true God-man who lived a perfect life, died to save us from our sins, and promises eternal life. If you don't believe that, you can't possibly have assurance. I don't want you to have assurance. John doesn't want you to have assurance. If you reject that Jesus, you should have no assurance. You would be knowingly, willingly deceiving yourself to think that you have the hope of heaven. Number two. Now, I'm just saying number one is the first domino that flows into the rest of these. Number two, confess your sins. Look at how clear John is. Chapter one, verse eight. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we, however, confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's no way you're a Christian if you don't own the reality that you're a sinner. And I'm not talking about saying things like, well, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm talking about owning your sin against an infinitely holy God 
who created you, sustains you, and commands you on how you should live in the world that he created for you. Confess your sins to him. And then as a result of Christ's finished work on the cross, God is able to forgive you of your sin and is able to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I'm telling you, there will be no proud people in heaven who have any tension with telling you how sinful they were. But there should also be no proud people in the church, meaning Christians who have any tension telling you how sinful they are right now. Because Jesus died for sinners like us. So we should glory, not in our sin, but in the reality that Jesus paid for our sin. On the cross, his death, the propitiation for our sin. He didn't just clean you up. You're a sinner who was saved from your sin. Forgiven and cleansed and made righteous right before God the Father Almighty. So no tension talking about sin because it allows us to boast in the finished work of Christ. Number three and number four go together. So love God's people, keep God's commands. Again, John is so clear. First John chapter four, verse 19. First John four, verse 19, he says, we love, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he hasn't seen. This commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. My favorite illustration is my wife, Linda. You can't possibly say that you love me if you don't love my wife. Those are Mutually exclusive. They, 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 they go together. If you don't, if you love me, you have to love my wife. Either you love me and therefore love my bride, or you hate me and therefore hate my bride. You can't love one and hate the other. Well, John's saying the same thing about Jesus and his people. If you say, I love God, and you hate his people, John's saying, you're a liar. You're full of it. And you're not a Christian because that's not possible. Now, just pause to think about that for a second. We should have more in common when a, with a Chinese Christian or an African sister or a South American brother than with our next door neighbor who doesn't know Christ. So, how do we know that we've come to know Christ? We have this supernatural love for God and for the people of God. Even the ones who are radically different than us. That we don't naturally have anything in common. We still love them. Not just people that are similar to us, but people from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which is number four, keeping God's commands. First John chapter five, verse one. John says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Again, to love Jesus is to believe in Jesus, is to obey Jesus. Those are synonyms in the Bible. In fact, John chapter 3, verse 36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. To believe is to obey, is to have eternal life. To not believe is to disobey, is to experience the wrath of God. The Bible is that clear. Which, of course, means, number five, we don't love the world. You know, one of the first passages that I ever memorized 
was 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here's the New American Standard, because I can't memorize the ESV because I memorized it in the New American Standard like 20 years ago. Right? For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with all of its lusts, all of its desires. But the one who does, there's obedience, the one who does the will of God abides forever. How do you know that you've come to know him? You're not living a double life. You're not acting like one thing on Sunday morning, on Tuesday night at Life Group. Smiles, life is good, how are you doing? Loving the Lord, living for his glory, better than I deserve, and then living like the world. This is so convicting to me when I came to faith. As I went to church on Sunday, where was I Friday night? I was in the bar drinking. Where was I Saturday night? In the bar drinking. Where was I Sunday morning? Hung over at church. Loving God. Doing better than I deserve. How do you know that you come to know him? You're not living a double life. You're the same person in church and out of church. You're a sinner saved by grace in church. And you're a sinner saved by grace out of church. There's humility. There's honesty. There's transparency. There's no tension to say, here's who I am. Please pray for me. I'd like to excel still more. But you're not hiding. That's hypocrisy. Christians should act like Christians whether people are watching or not. They should do that consistently, and they should do that increasingly, which, of course, means, number six, we persevere in the faith. Right back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, sounds like John 15, doesn't it? That's one of the ways in which we know it's John. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son, and you will abide in the Father. This is the promise that he made to you, eternal life. How do we have assurance of salvation? How do we know that we've really, truly come to know Lord Jesus Christ in a saving way? that we can know for certain, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that we're going to heaven when we die. These are the six things, according to John. We believe rightly that Jesus is the Christ. We confess our sins. We love God's people. We keep God's commandments. We don't love the world. And we persevere in the faith. And I just want to say, That's not just the way to have the assurance of salvation. I'm telling you, that is the pathway to the certainty of joy. Right now and forevermore. Flip back to 1 John chapter 1. Our passage this morning, look at what he says in verses 3 and 4. John says, that which you have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and is with his Son, Jesus Christ. So so fellowship with the Father, fellowship with the Son, and fellowship with the people of God. Linked specifically to verse 4. John writing, so that our joy may be complete. Now, I just want to say, Anybody here this morning who doesn't want fullness of joy? Anybody topped out on joy? I'm done. Too much. Is there anybody who doesn't want their joy to be complete? 
I mean, do you realize the greatest joy you will ever experience in this life is found when you rightly understand who Jesus is and you find your identity completely wrapped up in him, which means you're not finding your identity in other things. Just think about all of the different areas where we're tempted to put our identity. How about your job? Your boss is trying to push that identity on you. Make sure your identity is in your job. You should work late during the week. You should have your computer open all weekend. Make sure your identity is in your job. That's where you're going to find fullness of joy. Your position at work, your role that you serve, the job that you do, your significance hinges on how things are going at work. How about finding your identity in money? The house you own, the cars you drive, the things that you have and that you have to have. Keeping up with the Jones and buying the lie that whoever has the most toys at the end wins. You ever see a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer? It's the biggest lie in the world. How about finding your identity in what people think of you? Whether they like you or don't like you or want to spend time with you or don't want to spend time with you or like the posts that you put on Facebook or Instagram or whatever else is out there. Let me just ask, how, how's that going for you? You experiencing fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore in your job? Pure joy. How about your money? Soon as you have something, you want more. That's not pure joy. That's not complete joy. How about people's perception of you? Are you ever able to make everybody happy? Those things can never satisfy. Not ultimately, because God designed us to find our greatest joy in him and in his son and in his people. My point in all these things culminates in the greatest life you could ever imagine for yourself, but it starts by getting the Jesus question right. That's the first domino in the whole series that leads you straight to joy. So I'm here to tell you that there's no way that you can find endless joy in God apart from trusting in the person of Christ and the work of Christ rightly understood, meaning you must cling to Jesus as the one true God-man, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who really did leave his Father's throne above, really did live a humble, righteous, perfect life, really did die a substitutionary death as your representative, taking upon himself the judgment that you rightly deserve, and then rose on the third day. Without believing in the person of Christ or the work of Christ, you have a superficial understanding of who Jesus is. My fear is that you think you know about Jesus or that you think you believe in Jesus. And you take your last breath in this life and are shocked when he says, I never knew you. Clarity on Jesus as the incarnate Christ is a clear mark of Christians. And clarity on Jesus should bring us great joy. Right now, as we wait for that day when we will see him face to face, John talks about this. It's incredible how much he covers in five chapters. John writes, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children right now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when Jesus appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Can you even imagine the joy that you will have when you see him face to face? 
when all those who trust in Christ will encounter the living God, seeing Jesus, our Savior, face to face, beholding his eternal beauty with great joy. But that joy begins now with the certainty of knowing who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, that he really is the God-man, that he really is the Christian's representative, that he really is our sacrificial substitute. My desire is that you don't just think of these things as theoretical truths or dusty old doctrines, but that reality of the incarnate Christ would drive you to radical obedience, to love for his people, and for joy that is unspeakable so that the words of John would be a great blessing to you. 1 John 5, 13, these things were written so that you might know, that you might know with deep conviction that in Christ you have eternal life. May a right understanding of Jesus the incarnate Christ Bring a glorious assurance of salvation and great joy to your life. Allow me to pray. Father, we're so grateful for 1 John. I'm so grateful that we're going to be walking through these five chapters over the course of the next five weeks. And we have the opportunity to read them and study them, and memorize them. Lord, that we would have assurance of salvation, that we would know for certain that we have the hope of eternal life because we believe Jesus is the Christ. We confess our sins. We love God's people. We keep God's commands. We don't love the world, and we persevere in the faith. And so, Lord, there would be a growing confidence delighting in the Lord Jesus, being overwhelmed with his person and his work, and a passion to live for your glory, honor, and praise, which is not burdensome, not at all, but is great joy to our hearts. Lord, do that good work for our good and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.